Welcome to the Way of the Timeshare podcast. This is episode 16, Rites of Passage. Celtic god is Ingus Macog. He is also known as Aungus in Scots Gaelic. He is a member of the Tuadidanan, or the children of the goddess Danu, and he is the Celtic god of love. Ingus is roughly equivalent to the Greek god Apollo, as he is also a god of poetry and inspiration. Ingus is often pictured with four birds circling his head. These birds represent kisses. Ingus is also a god of youth. Ingus's father is the Dada, and Boan is his mother. Ingus is associated with Bruna Boyne, which is the Newgrange tomb by the River Boyne in Ireland. And this association also gives him the power of inspiration by the unconscious mind, as Bruna Boyne is associated with such powers. The passage tombs of Newgrange are places that stand between the worlds, so Ingus is also a god of shamanism. Plants associated with Ingus include roses, hazel trees, elder trees, and any plants with psychotropic properties. Animals sacred to Ingus include stags, owls, and falcons. Invoke Ingus in matters of love, poetic inspiration, and shamanic journeying. Seek the divine inspiration of the Owen with the help of Ingus. Throughout most of the history of humankind, Rites of passage have been an important part of a coming of age. Yet for some reason, our modern culture has few formalized rites of passage. What are we missing by not having ceremonies to mark significant events in our lives? Life is a series of transitions from the cradle to the grave. The success we have in completing a transition often depends on how well we've made similar transitions in the past. The purpose of rites of passage is to give tangible, visible confirmations that these transitions have been successfully completed. As we journey from youth to adulthood, these rites define our roles in society and give us the wisdom of dealing with the challenges we may meet in the future. Some rites of passage are also learning and teaching opportunities that allow the elders to impart wisdom to those who are participating in the rituals. The ultimate goal of a series of rites of passage is to transform a child whose primary thoughts are for herself and for his or her own well-being into an adult whose thoughts are for the community, for the tribe, and for its needs. On today's podcast, we will discuss some common rites of passage and some suggested forms and formats for each. As a general rule, There are five phases to a rite of passage. Where appropriate, the rituals that follow will offer suggestions for each of the following phases. The first phase is preparation. This phase is to prepare the initiate for what is to come. It could involve a period of purification or fasting, or any other preparation pertinent to the rite. The second phase is separation. In this phase, initiates are separated from the rest of the village in some way so that they may prepare themselves mentally for the task at hand. The third phase is isolation. 
Here the initiate spends time alone in contemplation. This phase often requires physical discomfort and self-deprivation. In some cultures there is even a challenge or an element of danger in this phase. The goal here is to allow the initiate to have a profound and transforming experience. Phase 4 is assimilation. After a transformative experience, the initiates are welcomed back into the tribe as adults with new roles, new rights, and new responsibilities. Phase 5 and the final phase is interpretation. In this phase, the initiate may talk about his or her experience with a wise elder who helps the initiate to process the experience and to gain further wisdom from it. Now let's look at some common rites of passage and how they might be celebrated. Starting in chronological order, we begin with the birth ceremony. Preparation for birth. We're all familiar with baby showers. Showers are one method of preparing for a birth. A quickening ceremony is another. The moment when a mother first feels her soon-to-be-born child moving within her is referred to as the quickening. The quickening ceremony celebrates this event and prepares for the arrival of the child. It's the beginning of preparations for the birth that is to come. Invite as many family members as you'd like to join you for your quickening ceremony. Prepare by creating an altar, preferably in the nursery. Adorn the altar with your favorite symbols of birth and new life. Fresh blossoms or fruits would be a good choice for this. Next, have each family member in attendance introduce themselves to the baby, still in its mother's womb. They may choose to read a poem or other message to the child during this introduction. You may end the ceremony by lighting candles in honor of the new life that is growing within the mother's womb. If possible, Imbolc is an excellent time for a quickening ceremony. The next phase in a birth ceremony is separation. In ancient times, the mother of the newborn went off alone with the midwife and selected female relatives to attend the birth, while the father and other male relatives waited nearby. In modern times, fathers often attend the birth, but if you are separated from the family during this time, you may prepare an invocation to your god or goddess. If you choose a short prayer, it may be used as a mantra to focus on the task at hand. Isolation As the labor progresses, you and your child become one in the effort of giving birth. No matter how many family members are in your support group during labor, at some point in time, your focus will become so absolute that you will become isolated from all others. Once the child is delivered, this isolation dissipates as the child becomes a separate person from you, and you are there with your child as he or she greets the world for the first time as a separate human being. Assimilation After the baby has been delivered, and after mom has had time to recover, you may wish to commemorate the occasion with a ritual blessing of the birth. This can be as elaborate or as simple as you wish. Your birth ritual could also incorporate a naming ritual or a dedication ritual. Details on these will follow. But the main purpose of a birth ritual is assimilation, as you are introducing the newborn infant to its family, its tribe, and its world. Interpretation After the birth of your child, especially if it's your first child, You'll be inundated with advice. You may choose to formalize such advice giving by incorporating it into your birth ritual. One way to do so is to have all family members present stand in a circle and give you their words of wisdom one by one. You could start the circle by asking each person present, what would you have me to know about raising a child? 
Our next rite of passage is a dedication ceremony. Preparation for a dedication ceremony is preparation in which a child, usually an infant, is dedicated to a particular religious or spiritual path by proxy. The proxy is usually a parent or a guardian who wishes to raise a child in a certain set of beliefs. Preparation for a dedication would include having both parents talk it over. Are both parents comfortable with the spiritual beliefs or path that the child is being dedicated to? What will the parents do if the child chooses some other path when he or she comes of age? How open are the parents to teaching the child about other faith systems? Separation The separation of the dedicant ceremony is usually simply that of dress. The child being dedicated wears a different garment to set him or her apart from the others at the ceremony. Isolation in a dedication ceremony. Astute parents will not force a religious choice on a child without due consideration. If the child is old enough to have a say in the matter, parents or guardians might suggest that the child take some time alone to weigh all the pros and cons and make an educated decision on whether this is the path for them. If the child has further questions after having had a period of isolation to think things over, the parents or other family members can clarify things for the child, who may then wish more time to think about the decision. This process can go on until the child is comfortable with the idea of dedication. During the assimilation phase of a dedication ceremony, the newly dedicated child is presented to the grove and welcomed by its members. Each member of the tribe present may wish to give a brief statement of welcome to the child. The interpretation phase is the longest for the dedication ceremony, simply because the dedication is the first step on a hopefully long journey into the way of the Taifshir, or into the way of the pagan, or into the way of whatever spiritual path the child is being dedicated to. Each subsequent step along the way will require illumination and further interpretation by the dedicant and by the elders, teachers, and mentors who will guide the dedicant along the way. The next rite of passage is a coming-of-age ceremony. A coming-of-age ceremony marks the onset of puberty. Preparation for such a ceremony would include teaching the child about sexuality, puberty, sexual responsibility, and sexual maturity. The child may also prepare by meditating on what it means to be an adult, and by contemplating how to best complete this important and crucial transition. If you plan to have a coming-of-age ceremony or ritual, you may wish to create an altar to Briad, the goddess of childbirth. The separation phase of a coming-of-age ceremony can be as elaborate or as simple as necessary. You may choose to have the children dress differently from other attendees at the ritual, or just to wear a piece of jewelry or other symbol that sets them apart. At some point during the ceremony, you may wish to lead the children off to isolation for a time of quiet contemplation and peer support. In a coming-of-age ceremony when more than one child is involved, they may be isolated at some point in the ceremony so that they may lend support and advice to each other. This time may also be used to compose a brief vow to read during the assimilation phase. In the assimilation phase of a coming-of-age ceremony, Briad is the goddess often invoked. As the initiates return from their period of isolation, they may leave a small offering on Briad's altar, beseeching her blessings as they transition into adulthood. They may also wish to recite a brief pledge or vow concerning their newfound freedoms and responsibilities. Interpretation After the assimilation phase of a coming-of-age ceremony, when the initiates have been presented to the grove or to the tribe, 
an informal question and answer period or a reception can be held so that the attendees may discuss the experience with elders. Next is a naming ceremony. There are three main types of naming ceremonies. The first type is when a parent gives a name to the child. The second is when a child is old enough to choose a name for him or herself. The third is when an honored mentor or teacher gives a student a name. In any case, the person doing the naming should prepare by researching the meanings of the name about to be given. Does it suit the individual? Is the name something the receiver will be proud of? Does it convey the sort of person the individual is? Separation in the naming ceremony. If you choose to have a formal naming ceremony, you may wish to have those who are to be named wait in isolation until called by those who will be doing the naming. While waiting in isolation, the initiates may choose to spend time meditating on the meaning of their names, why these names were chosen for them, unless of course the names themselves were chosen by the initiates. In this case, they would meditate on why they chose the name for themselves. And finally, on the nature and the magic of the power of naming. Next comes the assimilation phase. As each person in the naming ceremony is given a name, they are introduced to the grove one at a time and welcomed by their new names. One possible use of the interpretation phase might be to have each person present a brief statement on the significance of naming ceremonies. A naming ceremony can be quite a powerful experience. I still remember mine from 1979. It opened the door to a larger world and a new sense of identity for me and for my place in the tribe. Next is the healing ceremony. There are many types of healing rituals throughout the world, and each involves a different type of preparation. Most involve some sort of ritual purification before beginning the work. My personal preference is to either smudge the room with some type of incense, or to sweep the room with a hawthorn branch. The type of branch used would probably be dictated by the type of work about to be done, but for general purposes, Hawthorne works well for me. Separation Prior to beginning any healing work, the healer, or the vate, traditionally takes some time to ground and center, and to meditate on the task at hand. The vate may also consult the omens or partake in a visiting quest to delve into the nature of the illness. Isolation in a Healing Ritual or Ceremony only the Vait and the person being healed are present at this phase. This is done to minimize any chaotic or otherwise negatively influential energies in the room. Assimilation In the assimilation phase of a healing ritual, the person who has been cured of the illness returns to the rest of the tribe, free of disease and therefore free from quarantine. Interpretation in most aboriginal healing rituals, some interpretation is given to the illness. What lessons did the person with the illness learn? What is the meaning of the recovery? If the ritual is unsuccessful, and if the person does not recover, what meaning does this have for the individual and for his or her family? Such interpretations usually focus on the deeper spiritual meaning of illnesses and trying times as opposed to the immediate physical aspects of the illness. Dr. Jean Shinoda Bolin, in her book Crossing to Avalon, does a wonderful job of illustrating the transformative power of illness and trauma from a spiritual perspective. Next in chronological order is the marriage or hand fasting ceremony. There are many layers of preparation for a marriage or a hand fasting, as anyone who has ever been married can tell you. 
Perhaps the most significant of these stages of preparation is preparing the couple for what they are about to do. I never conduct a hand fasting or a wedding unless the partners have had at least three premarital counseling sessions with either me or with another qualified counselor. What often happens in marriages or hand fastings is that the couple focuses on the romantic aspects and neglects the practical and spiritual aspects. Who pays the bills? How will the children be raised? Who will be responsible for which chores? How much input will friends and family have on the ceremony itself and on the lives of the couple after the ceremony? All these questions have to be answered, and it's better to answer them before the marriage rather than after. Separation We're all familiar with the injunction that the groom isn't to see the bride prior to the ceremony on the day of the wedding. This is a vestige of an old Celtic superstition. Many cultures isolate and separate both the bride and the groom for a time of preparation, purification, and contemplation before the actual wedding ceremony. Each meets with the elders of the tribe, men going into isolation with the men, and women going into isolation with the women. Once the couple has been isolated, they take this time to speak with the elders of their own gender regarding their upcoming marriage. The elders impart the wisdom, and the persons being married receive the wisdom. This, of course, assumes that the couple being married or handfasted is indeed a couple, and a heterosexual couple at that. If the couple is a same-sex couple, they may meet with the elders of whichever gender they would prefer to. And if the handfasting involves more than a couple, for example, a polyamorous relationship with more than two members, then each member of the relationship could meet in isolation with the elders of their choice. The main purpose of this separation and isolation is to achieve the wisdom of the elders regarding relationships and romantic love. So this could be accomplished in any number of ways. It's up to the couple being married or handfasted to select a method appropriate for their ceremony. Assimilation As a couple transitions from single life into married life, they join a larger community of couples who have made a similar commitment. After near the end of most weddings and handfasting ceremonies, there's a presentation of the new couple to those gathered for the ceremony. This important assimilation ritual allows those gathered to know that there is a change that has been made. It also allows the couple to recognize the fact that henceforth their community will see them as a couple and not as separate individuals. The interpretation phase of a wedding or a hand fasting begins at the ceremony and continues throughout the life of the marriage. As each partner comes to view their relationship through the variations and transitions in married life, each comes to know different aspects of the other. A couple with a newborn child will have different challenges than a couple with teen children or a couple with children who are leaving home for the first time. Each of these transitions brings emotional changes that will have to be interpreted by each partner and sometimes with the help of a cherished and respected elder. Next on the list is an ordainment ceremony. In the Taisho community, the standards for preparation for ordainment can be quite high. Druids in general prize education, and Taishers in particular do. Many Taisho organizations require quite a bit of education before accepting a candidate for ordainment. Preparation for ordainment isn't just about the spiritual aspects of the way of the Taisho. An ordained member of the Taisha clergy should also be proficient in non-profit administration, fundraising, organizing groups and events, counseling, and any number of other responsibilities associated with keeping a grove up and running. Most ordainment rituals involve some sort of purification at the beginning of the ceremony. Offerings and blessings are usually also spoken. Most Ordained clergy in the order of the Taishar are prepared through Elder Grove Seminary, and we have extensive education programs there to prepare our clergy for all sorts of ministries. 
separation. During this phase of ordainment, the candidates for ordainment are separated from the clergy and from the audience for a period of ritual preparation and purification. Isolation During the period of isolation prior to an ordainment ceremony, candidates for ordainment may engage in grounding and centering meditations, invocation of their patron god or matron goddess, or in quiet contemplation of the life of Tavshir ministry. Assimilation Upon completion of the ordainment ritual, the newly ordained Taisha clergy are presented to the grove. In some rituals, the new clergy are allowed to give a brief statement or to conduct their first ritual as Taisha clergy. Interpretation Throughout life, Taisha clergy and ministers are constantly reinterpreting their walk with the gods and goddesses and how this walk plays out in their own daily lives. They are also the vessel through which the earth and the land of the young are brought together and interpreted. It is the duty of the Taifshir minister to offer these interpretations to the grove for the spiritual growth and edification of all its members. Next on the list is a reconciliation ceremony. Historically, Druids have always been peacemakers. The Mabinogian says that Druids could stop warring armies by simply stepping between them. So rituals of reconciliation are a very important part of the Druid tradition and of the Taifshir tradition. In ancient Scottish times, when two kings argued, people would leave them both on an island with enough food and supplies for three days. They would then come back in three days to see if the matter had been resolved. If it hadn't been, they didn't leave any more food. They just left the kings there until they could work it out or die of starvation while trying. To prepare a ritual of reconciliation, the parties involved should explore whether it would take anything to forgive the other party, and what exactly that would be. They should also explore what would happen to the relationship if each chose to harbor bitterness and resentment instead of letting it go. They should then engage in some sort of self-purification of negative thoughts about the other person. In the separation phase, the parties involved should be kept separated until they are able to think rationally about their reconciliation. When both have agreed that they are ready to continue with the reconciliation, then the ceremony can continue. Until that time, both parties should remain isolated from each other. During the period of isolation, each person involved should consider what led to the disagreement in the first place. Was there a misinterpretation? Was there an element of unfairness present? If so, how can this element be removed or minimized? Is this disagreement the result of incorrect assumptions on one part or the other? Why is reconciliation important in the first place? When both parties feel that they have answered these questions to their own satisfaction, then the ceremony may continue. In the assimilation phase of reconciliation, the assimilation refers to the fact that the parties involved are being reassimilated into each other's good graces. The best way to symbolize this is with some sort of ritual of letting go, followed by some sort of ritual rejoining. Examples could be that problems are written on parchment and burned or buried, or floated down a river, or released in some other form or fashion. The possibilities for this are only as limited as your own imagination. The ritual of rejoining could be as simple as a handshake or a hug. Again, it's up to the parties involved. In the interpretation phase of the reconciliation, parties should focus on positive outcomes. Instead of rehashing the reasons for the disagreement in the first place, focus on interpreting the event in a way that prevents future disagreements and misunderstandings. Our final 
rite of passage is a death ceremony. Death ceremonies are sometimes called funerals. Preparation for a Taishir funeral is particularly meaningful to most of the people who have ever experienced it. This is because Taishirs, like many Native American and other Aboriginal cultures, have a special reverence for the departed ancestors. Although a funeral is a sad time of remembrance of the departed one, and thoughts of how much he or she will be missed are present. It may also be a time of celebration. The deceased has gone on to join the other sacred ancestors in the land of the young. Preparation for sending the departed on this journey might include creating an altar of photographs and memorabilia of the deceased. You might also ask each person planning to attend to share a story or a remembrance of the departed. Separation and isolation of the dead has become far more a part of our culture now than it was in the past. As soon as a person gets terminally ill, they're swept off to the hospital. As soon as they die, they're swept off to the morgue. As soon as the morgue is done with them, they're swept off to the funeral home and then to the grave as quickly as possible. We see the body as little as possible. It's almost as if we're afraid that death is contagious or something. I'm old enough to remember a time when the bodies of the dead were left in the living room during the entire funeral party. There was even a tradition of sitting up with the dead during the last night in the family home so that everyone could say their goodbyes. The separation in the many Taifshire death rituals involves allowing each family member to be alone with the body of the departed one for a time in order to say what needed to be said. This helps to achieve a sense of closure. The isolation in a funeral or death ritual allows each person who wishes to do so to spend some time with the departed. This is a time for sharing any lasting things that you would like to say to the departed. It's a time for forgiveness, reconciliation, blessings, and goodbyes. Assimilation in the Taifshire Funeral Rite There's a portion where those gathered acknowledge that the departed one is about to be accepted into the Hall of the Ancestors. It's also a time for remembering that one day we too shall join the Ancestors. There's no single interpretation of a death experience. Each person has his or her own ideas about what happens when we pass on. The only way to know for sure is to actually experience death ourselves. We'll all do that soon enough. The way of the Taifshir is a spirituality of individual expression, believing that it is up to the individual to create their own interpretation of the death of a loved one, or of their own death. Whatever way you choose to celebrate your own rites of passage in your life, Follow the wisdom of the ancestors and the elders, and your way will be a blessed one.
ate the earth well. It was not given to you by your parents. It was loaned to you by your children. We did not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Chief Seattle We live in a throwaway society. The average American now produces five pounds of garbage per day, compared to the one pound average per day in 1960. One of the byproducts of living in a throwaway society is that our children spend a lot of time in automobiles eating fast foods from disposable containers. They also spend most of their time indoors in front of the television, computers, and video games. Not only do these activities contribute to the continual pollution of the environment, but they also contribute to a more sedentary, less active, and therefore less healthy lifestyle. Our junk food diet can have many negative effects on our children. Hormone residues in commercial beef products could contribute to the early onset of puberty in girls, while bovine growth hormone has been linked to increased risk of cancer. Obesity is an epidemic in the United States, especially among our children. Diet isn't the only source of problems for our children. Teen suicide is becoming more common every day in the United States. Could it be that one of the causes of the increase in teen suicide is that our teens have discovered that buying more stuff isn't the key to happiness? Media messages bombard our children with the idea that if they have the right clothes, listen to the right music, eat the right food, and drink the right sodas, they'll be happy and popular. Our children are given the illusion that happiness lies in owning and consuming more. Because of this, they buy more and more material goods in the quest for happiness and popularity. When they discover that these things don't make them any happier, the impact can be devastating. The influence that television and mass media have on our children is so great that the American Academy of Pediatrics now recommends that children two years and older shouldn't watch TV at all. After the age of two, they recommend a maximum of one hour a day. Putting a stop to the brainwashing of rampant consumerism sounds like a wonderful ideal, but in the real world, children go to school and have friends with televisions, video games, and material goods. How can you raise a child to want to live sustainably without becoming a family of hermits? Richard Liu, in his book Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, discusses the growing generation gap between modern parents and children. Lou was trying to talk about the process of catching crawdads with his children one day when he suddenly realized the child had no frame of reference for the experience. His son was so disconnected from nature that he had no idea what his father was talking about. That conversation with his young son was the inspiration for his book. In Last Child in the Wood, Lou reviews and discusses the environmental, sociological, psychological, and spiritual implications of our abandonment of nature. As children become increasingly connected to the Playstations, to the Xboxes, cell phones, electronics, etc., etc., they become less and less attached to nature, spending less time in natural environments. In recent years, the amount of time the average child spends in nature continues to decline, while the average time spent indoors with electronic devices continues to increase. When children are young, teaching them a green lifestyle is much easier. When they get older, it gets harder. As your children get older and more independent, the influence of their peers becomes more and more important. You can prepare them for this transition by teaching them the difference between needs and wants. Explain to them that even though they can recognize the difference between a need and a want, that doesn't necessarily mean that the want will go away. They have to learn to find things other than material goals to fill the gap. You can teach your children to occupy their time with activities that offer opportunities for learning and personal growth. Instead of television, spend quality time outdoors playing, preferably as a family. Instead of playing a video game, read a book about a favorite topic. If they're young enough, read to them yourself. 
encourage them to ask questions instead of asking mom or dad for a ride to the neighbor's house, teach them to walk or ride a bicycle. Instead of running to the mall to buy the latest fashions, teach them to take the time to learn to make their own fashions through fabric painting, sewing, embroidery, or even tie-dyeing. Teach your children to value the smaller things in life while interacting with family and friends. While peer pressure to conform to the dominant culture of consumerism can be overwhelming, especially as children reach the teen years, there are still ways you can minimize the impact. Find local environmental organizations that offer activities for children. By taking your children to such activities, they'll meet new friends who have been taught similar lessons about sustainability and the environment. If there aren't any such organizations in your area, why not start one? What better way to get your children involved in environmental issues than by having them participate in creating a green organization for children? Many towns and cities have fairs, concerts, and other events that center on environmental issues. By attending these events with your children, they're exposed to the wider world of green living. Music is an especially good way to positively influence teens. Coffee houses and concerts are often friendly to green living issues. So are organic farms and food stores. Many bookstores also specialize in environmental and nature topics and occasionally sponsor such events. The secret to helping your children avoid negative peer influences is to follow the green. The more green events you can attend that are family friendly, the more opportunities your children will have to interact with positive role models and peer influences. Another good source of activities for your children is local, state, and national parks. Many parks offer day camps in the summer that explore nature and allow hands-on experiences for your children at little or no cost. Such programs can include ecology, geology, biology, or a host of other outdoor-related activities. To find national parks near you, visit www.nps.gov for National Park Service and click on your state on the map. Usually the parks have an activities director responsible for day camps and other activities and education. You can also check your local newspaper and telephone directories for information on activities at state and local parks. Don't forget that children learn more by example than by what you tell them. If you want to raise green children, you have to live a green lifestyle yourself. As my own children have gotten older, I've often been pleasantly surprised at what they have shown me that they were paying attention to after all, even though at times it felt like I was talking to a post. They're watching and paying attention more than you know. If they see you expressing concern for the environment, they will too. Don't worry if it doesn't always appear to be sinking in. They often listen and learn more than appearances would indicate. When teaching children about the environment, the temptation to present a gloom and doom viewpoint is sometimes overpowering. The environment is in trouble, especially if present trends continue. There's no doubt about that, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a positive side. By constantly focusing on the negative, parents tend to come across as preachy. I can assure you from experience that nothing will shut down a child's interest faster than a preachy parent. Teach them about the damage we're doing to the environment, but also emphasize that by adopting a green lifestyle, we can minimize or even eliminate the danger. Instead of presenting a woe-is-me attitude, teach them that they have a unique opportunity. They can be the generation that saved the planet. One of the most important things you can do to teach your children to care about nature is to actually provide opportunities to experience nature outdoors. Even if you live in a city, you can take your children to the park. If that's not practical, get them a planter full of dirt, if nothing else, and plant seeds together. There's something primal and elemental in planting a seed and watching it grow from day to day. Watering and caring for a living thing gives them an opportunity to learn and grow themselves as well. Children make direct connections with their parents at an early age, and they make connections with nature at an early age. By teaching them to nurture and respect the natural world as children, 
you're training them to become adults who nurture and respect the natural world. Most children think, for example, that water comes from a faucet, that food comes prepackaged in a grocery store, and that clothing comes from the mall. Few have made the connection that all of the basic goods we need for survival come from the environment in some way. They might not even realize that we don't take care of the environment, we won't have food, we won't have clothing, and we won't have shelter. They may have learned in school the dry facts about what our resources come from. But have they made the emotional connection? Have they actually gone out into the wild to see water in a fresh mountain stream? Or to see corn growing in a field? Or to see lumber being harvested? It's amazing what a day spent on the farm picking vegetables or planting them can do for one's perspective. If such opportunities are available where you live, by all means find a way to let your children experience at least one in their lifetimes. The more familiar our children become with nature and our natural resources, the more environmentally aware they will become. It's very difficult to pollute or otherwise harm nature once you've developed a relationship with the natural world. One activity I highly recommend is to get a field guide to wild plants and animals from your region. Take your children for hikes to see who can identify the most flora and fauna. Some field guides also list the medicinal properties of these plants. With enough practice, you and your children can become amateur herbologists. The original inhabitants of North America believed that every plant had a purpose. To them, there was no such thing as a weed. To them, a weed was simply a plant whose purpose hadn't been discovered yet. If you come across a new and unique plant while hiking with your children, challenge them to learn about it. In doing so, you turn that weed into a useful plant and a teaching opportunity. When my children were growing up, they had scrapbooks in which they glued samples of plants they'd found on our hiking trips together. Beside each sample, they wrote at least one use for the plant, where they found it, and in what season. Not all children will be drawn to herbology, but there are other ways you can connect them with nature. The adventure is finding what stimulates and interests them. While we're on the subject of education, an option that some may choose is homeschooling. There's a grassroots movement of environmentalist parents who are homeschooling. In these groups, homeschooling doesn't mean that the children are alone with the parents all day. These parents meet in a group so that the children have time to socialize as well as to learn. Often such groups meet in parks or other outdoor areas, using the location as an educational opportunity to discuss the local flora and fauna. And never forget that a large part of sustainability is about returning control to the individual rather than to a corporation, government, or other institution. Homeschooling allows parents more choices and more freedom when it comes to educating their children, returning the control of the child's education to the parent. Another excellent way to get children involved and curious about the natural world is through animals. Most of us have fond childhood memories of pets and family, and many pet owners can tell you all about an animal's ability to communicate without having to rely on language. This unspoken language can fascinate your children as well. In learning to care for and love for a pet, a child learns about love and responsibility required in caring for all living things. Such experiences in nature with you and your child and your entire family together can itself be a rite of passage. In the way of the Tyveshire, we use the Celtic tree alphabet known as the Oum. In this section of the podcast, we will present one character of the Oum each week, offering information on the meaning of each letter of the Oum alphabet, trees associated with each letter, the healing and magical properties of each tree, gods and goddesses associated with each tree and letter, and the divinatory meanings of each letter of the Oum. Since we will be discussing medicinal uses of the plants in this segment of the podcast, please remember that herbal medicine requires caution and practice. 
none of the medicinal uses discussed on the Way of the Taishir podcast should be attempted by a novice. Some parts of the plants of the oam are poisonous, and people with allergies should also be aware of the potential allergic reactions to plants. If you are interested in herbal medicine, find a skilled practitioner and take lessons. Do not attempt to use medicinal plants without the supervision of an expert. In the Olm alphabet, the letter combination NG is represented by natal. Its divinatory meaning is health, harmony, and balance. The tree associated with this letter combination is the reed. In Great Britain, the reed is a variety of elm that doesn't grow in North America. The Order of the Taisha uses the slippery elm for this letter. Healing Properties In Britain, the dwarf elm, which is the oam reed, is known as the reed tree. In North America, the equivalent would be the elm tree. Powdered bark from the slippery elm tree can be made into a type of milk for those who are lactose intolerant. In a tea, this powdered bark is a mild sedative. It also eases an upset stomach. A poultice of elm aids in treating poison ivy, and the inner bark of the slippery elm can be made into an infusion to reduce inflammation of the mucous membranes. Magical Uses The elm is the tree of the goddess in her aspect as crone. Elm is feminine, and it is considered a tree of the fae. Since the fairies love to sing and dance, Elm magic works for anything involving music. It's also a powerful magic for divination. Elm is associated with our darker impulses, and elm magic can be used to draw these out so that they may be dealt with in constructive ways rather than destructive ways. Twigs of elm worn in a bag around the neck are said to give the wearer the gift of eloquent speech. Tie a yellow ribbon around an elm twig and toss it into a fire to keep people from gossiping about you. Mix two parts of dried elm bark with one part of ground poppy seeds to make a powder that will give you the power of invisibility. Grind the ingredients together using a mortar and pestle at midnight during a new moon. When you have mixed these two into a fine powder, Sprinkling a little on your head and shoulders is said to render you invisible. An elm staff may be used to repel lightning and thunderstorms. Elm wands and staffs are also good for any magical working concerning rites of passage, especially when those rites concern passing from this world to the world beyond. This power makes it a favorite wood for psychopomps, those who conduct the souls of the dead to the land of the young to be reborn. Elm may be used for any type of fairy magic and is good for coming of age ceremonies. It is especially good for croning or saging rites. Gods associated with this plant are Pool and Aron.
You've been listening to the Way of the Tyshire podcast on International Pagan Radio, where it's all pagan all the time. This has been episode 16, Rites of Passage. Music on this episode was Autumn Mists by Schenka the Vate from the forthcoming album Mist on the Mountain, due out in spring of this year. The Way of the Tyshire is the official podcast of the Order of the Tyshire. You can learn more about us at tyshire.com. That's T A I B H S E A R.com. The Way of the Tyshire is a podcast about druidry and paganism as practiced by the Order of the Tyshire. Paganism is a wide and diverse community, and we don't claim to speak for all pagans. You can get in touch with us at the show at podcast at tyshire.com. Again, that's podcast at T-A-I-B-H-S-E-A-R dot com. The Way of the Tyshire is sponsored by Elder Grove Seminary, offering the best in pagan education with online bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in ministry and divinity. Learn more about Elder Grove Seminary at eldergrove.org. Until next time, blessings of the ancestors.